Hello, Water Christ, we want to welcome you to another week in this incredible series that we're calling The New Man. We're unpacking this and we're coming into this understanding of what the scripture says about a completely new species, a completely new creation that began with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's so exciting to see this. It's so exciting, you know, we say this all the time, to see the dots connecting and to see this revelation come to life and to see it all over scripture, there's so much life in that. This week, Masood is back with us as we're looking at what the scripture says about ascending to the mountain of sonship. And so the scripture really brings us out in so many dimensions and so many facets, and there's so much to us to understand about this principle of a mountain in the scripture and what it means. So we're excited to get into it. Remember, stay with us to the end. Uh, we're going to come back. We're going to recap a lot. There's a lot of material. I think we cover more scripture in this week's teaching than we ever have in any other week. So we cover a tremendous amount of material in a short amount of time um, with Masood. And we're going to come back and summarize that and bring that together for you at the end. So please stay with us as we do that. God bless you, family, and we'll see you on the other side. Hello, everyone. This is Masood Ramandi, and I'm happy to be with you with another session from uh, the New Man series. Uh, today, I want to pick up from where I left off in the last week's message, and we're going to look at um, something that perhaps is not uh, is not in at first something that you would, you know you read it and you understand it, but when you begin to look into the details of this through the symbology of the Old Testament, you begin to understand the depth and the importance of what that is. And what I'm uh, going to be talking to you about is the mountain of the Lord. Now, the reason I say this, because last week I talked about being an heir or being a slave, uh, being a free person or being a slave person, being someone that receives the inheritance or being someone that doesn't receive it, being someone that is free from the elements of the world of the law uh, or being someone that is actually subject to the elements of that world of the law. Now, all of that, if you would have continued to read Galatians chapter 4, you would have realized that Paul begins to talk to uh, uh, basically the Jewish people uh, saying that even you in your own law, you have the story of Abraham and you have the story of his two uh, basically wives and you have the story of the two sons that were born from these, those two wives and these two uh, basically are symbolic everything that is written about them is symbolic and it's just amazing to see uh, things like this are in the Bible that they are clearly uh, speaking of the historical event as symb symbolic uh, precious truths that we can use and instead of, you know, talking about once again in flesh, this nation, that nation, this tribe, that tribe, this uh, gender or this, uh, you know, uh, language or whatever, we can look at them by the Spirit of God and understand what the, the message was in those stories. So anyways, Paul goes on to say that these two are symbolic. I mean, you know the story. I'm not going to spend so much time on uh, this part of Galatians chapter 4. Because I want to take you through some Old Testament scriptures. But look at uh, for a minute to what he says in Galatians chapter 4, verse 24. It says, these things are symbolic. For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, uh, to bondage, which is Hagar. Okay, so it says two covenants. Everything that was mentioned about the two wives, uh, that brought forth two different sons. These speak of two covenants. And previously, we also looked at that the law was added after the promise. So there was a covenant of promise. There was a covenant of the law. All right. So these two uh, were basically, they showed themselves in the two wives of Abraham. So what it says is from Mount Sinai, the mountain of Sinai. And I said, I'm going to be talking to you about the mountain of the Lord. But Sinai is not the mountain of the Lord. We're going to see what the mountain of the Lord is. And it says Sinai, in fact, doesn't give birth to sons. It gives birth to bondage to those slaves that in uh, the last week's message, 
uh, we looked at those who are under the element of the law. They are bound. They are under guardians, stewards, tutors. They're not free. They're not being taught by their father. They're not being uh, trained by the father. They don't know who their father is. They don't know what he has and they don't know uh, what they have in him. And then he says, for this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Who is the one who had a husband in the context? The first wife of uh, Abraham, which was Hagar, or basically the first one that brought forth a son. And it says there was also a barren one. Who was that? Sarah. So it says it wasn't, we didn't have any child for Abraham from Sarah. The first child was from Hagar. And it says these are two covenants trying to say God didn't have any uh, children born from the covenant according to promise. Everyone that was born was according to the law. Okay. And then when Jesus came, he was the firstborn of the new covenant. Okay. He was the one that was born according to the promise. We looked at this last week that the promise was made to Abraham that he would have a seed. And that came to Sarah after Hagar had given birth. So trying to say the two mountains represent the two covenants because one is said to be Hagar and the other one is Sarah. Look at verse 28. Now we brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. Now, this is the children of the covenant of promise, but the covenants were two mountains. So you are the child of a certain mountain. Okay, you are the child of a certain mountain. You are born on a certain mountain. Now, um, quickly, let me show you something uh, in the book of Revelation. Look at the book of Revelation and chapter 21. Verse 10. He carried, he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. To a great and high mountain. In the spirit. He carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. That means this mountain is not a touchable mountain. It's not a natural mountain. It's not like Mount Sinai. Okay, it's a different type of mountain. It's a mountain in the spirit upon which we read, he showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem. So on this mountain is the holy Jerusalem. All right. So, so far, we are reading about Basically, the two covenants representing two mountains. But then the book of Revelation of Jesus Christ, which reveals Jesus Christ, begins to tell us that now there is a high and great mountain in the spirit. And John was carried there. And on this mountain, he saw a woman, which is the bride of Christ, the holy Jerusalem. Now, let me take you to the book of Hebrews to first understand what this mountain is. Look at chapter... Uh, 12 of the book of Hebrews verse 18 for you have not come to the mountain that may be touched okay pause you haven't come to a mountain that be, may be touched but there are only two mountains that we uh, looked at one was Sinai and there was another mountain that we're going to be finding what that mountain is the first one is touchable the second one John said it was in the spirit it's not touchable it's not a natural mountain. It's not in natural Israel in the Middle East. So you're not going to find that anywhere on this earth. So you shouldn't be looking for any mountain uh, like that anywhere on this planet earth. It is in the spirit. 
All right, we have to establish that first. So he says, you haven't come to this mountain. As these people that the book of Hebrews was all about your conscience being purged so you can draw near and you can now be on this mountain, the new mountain. You haven't come to the old mountain. You haven't come to Sinai, which gives birth to bondage. You have come to a certain mountain. What that mountain is, is given to us in verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion. All right. So the second mountain is Zion. Okay. So Zion is the new covenant of the Lord. It's a mountain that gives birth to heirs, not to slaves. Just as we read in Galatians chapter 4, we are like Isaac. We are not like Ishmael. Ishmael was not the heir. He was not, he was born of a slave woman. All right. And we looked at this in the last week's message again, that Christ came born of a woman, born under the law. Okay. Born under the law, he, was, he himself was not born under the law, but the one that he was born from was born under the law, okay? Because before him, everyone was under the law. Well, he says he came out of her, and then obviously through the course of time, he grew in favor, stature, and uh, basically wisdom with God. He began to recognize that I have a father, and he never again uh, identified himself in the flesh, all right? So he began to see and hear the voice that told him that you are my beloved son, okay? So he was the firstborn of the new covenant of the Lord. Anyways, so he says, you have come to this Mount Zion. Now he goes on to say, this is the city of the living God. Because remember, the Revelation chapter 21 said there is a mountain and top of this mountain is a city called the Holy Jerusalem. And it says you have come to a mountain and you have come to a city. And this, that city is the city of the living God. So that means whatever we are reading has nothing to do with something in the future once again. And when you put yourself under time waiting for a future, you're put subjecting yourself once again to the elements of the old world. We looked at that uh, previously in the last week's message. And by doing so, you're making yourself a slave. You're going back to Sinai. You're not on Mount Zion. All right. So he says, therefore, what do you read in the book of Revelation? Chapter 21, about a mountain, about a city on top of that. This has nothing to do with heaven. This has nothing to do with future. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is you finding the truth, finding the way, finding life in Jesus Christ by knowing him, by allowing the veil to be removed from your hearts and your minds and your eyes so you can see him and you can understand the mystery of your union with him. And by doing so, you begin to realize all these beautiful terminologies, symbolic languages, allegories, types and shadows of the Old Testament find their meaning only and only and only in Christ Jesus, and you are in him. So these beautiful stories of mountains and cities and trees and rivers and fountains and all those things have nothing to do with another planet called heaven somewhere. They all have to do with the reality of your life with him. And he says, only under the new covenant, you can experience that. Only under freedom, you can experience that. Only when you don't subject yourself to the old, you can experience that. All right. Now, uh, we also looked at the fact that uh, um, basically in Colossians chapter 2, uh, the elements of that world were called the Sabbath, the new moon, the feasts, and all of that. Right. And he said, why are you again subjecting yourself to those, to those things? Why do you allow people other people, teachers, to rob you of your reward, still causing you to be like a slave, waiting for a certain time so that you can receive a blessing from the Lord. Those were all basically shadows, the copies of what was to come. And now this is what was to come. So verse 22, a mountain, then a city, 
which is the Holy Jerusalem, and it says the innumerable company of angels, you have come to this, to the general assembly. Okay, this the word general assembly means, or a better translation for this would have been the festal gatherings. A gathering that in the old, under the old, would happen once a year for a certain feast. So people, Jews, wherever they were scattered on this planet, on that specific day, they would come to celebrate that feast in Jerusalem. And it says now that is a spiritual principle, a spiritual reality, a spiritual uh, life for us to recognize that we have come to a mountain and that city, Jerusalem, to celebrate the feast. But when? Now. Not in future, not once a year. This is like every day, as many times as you want to celebrate these feasts with the Lord. And what were the feasts of the Lord? The Passover, the unleavened bread, the first food, the Pentecost, the trumpet, um, the um, basically atonement, uh, and the tabernacles, the seven feasts of the Lord. So these are the things that you can be partaking of them only just like John did in Revelation. He was carried into, in spirit, into that high mountain, all right? So in the spirit, that's why everything about this new covenant is about the spirit. And your blessing comes from you ascending in the spirit and in your descension, bringing down the blessing of that spirit realm, all right? So anyways, he says, you have come to this, uh, to this mountain, to this city, the heavenly Jerusalem, innumerable company of angels, the festal gatherings of the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven to God. So you have come to God, to uh, basically the judge of all, to the spirit, spirits of just men made perfect. So this is a spirit gathering. It's a gatherings of the spirits. That's you and that's me. That's who, that those, that's those who are recognizing that they are not a living soul anymore. They are life-giving spirits. And they don't identify anymore with the weakness of the soul. They identify with the strength of the spirit. Okay, so that's a different teaching by itself. But uh, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. So he says, you have come. That means there has to be a reality of these things in our lives. And to the blood of the sprinkling that speaks better things than, than the blood of Abel. Okay, so he says, you have come to this mountain, to this city, to Jesus, the mediator of the covenant. And you have also come to this festal gathering where you can eat and drink and be merry and rejoice uh, before the presence of the Lord. You know what actually we are reading? Look at the type that was mentioned in the book of uh, Exodus, chapter 24, uh, verse 9. It says, then Moses, um, then Moses went up also. Moses went up. So you're beginning to see the concept of a mountain. Also Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and, 70, and the 70 elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. They went up and they saw the God of Israel. Have you come to this mountain? Have you come to God, the judge of us, to judge of us all? Well, you begin to see that what Hebrews is talking about is the fulfillment in the spirit of that which was once happened uh, to the people of Israel. Look at what we read after that. And they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone, and it was like, the very heavens in its clarity. So heaven is not a place. Heaven is where God is. All right, see law and think about that for a moment. So when you are in his presence, that's it. Okay, he dwells in the heaven. That means wherever he is, is the heaven. Verse 11, but on the nobles of the children of Israel, he did not lay his hand, so they... Uh, so they saw God and they ate and drank. So you have come also to this mountain, to this festal gathering, a place of feasts where you can eat bread, drink his wine, eat the best, uh, you know, uh, meat that could ever be served to, uh, 
uh, eat of the fatness of his word and drink of his uh, wine of the spirit and by doing so you are basically rejoicing in your God you're eating from him you're receiving from him verse 12 then the Lord said to Moses come up to me on the mountain and be there okay a bit more ascension something beyond even what the children of Israel experience the elders of Israel experienced the 70 Moses is called to even go higher okay these are the languages that are used in the book of Revelation uh, John hears that there was a voice that called him he said come up here he was already in the spirit in fact, if you look at Revelation chapter 1, it says, I was in the Spirit in the Lord's day, and I saw. And then, three chapters later, once again he hears a voice come up. So that means he was in the Spirit, but he is called higher in the Spirit. This is the mountain of the Lord. This is what I said, Mount Zion. I mean, the glorious mountain of sonship, where the sons can be with their fathers in his presence and celebrate. Let's continue. Then the Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and be there. And I will give you the tablets of stone and the law and, and the commandments, which I have written that you may teach them. So Moses arose with his assistant Joshua and Moses went up to the mountain of God. Verse 16. Now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Okay, so look at how this Sinai suddenly is replaced by a different mountain in Matthew chapter uh, 16 and 17. Look at chapter 16 and 17. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. After six days, just like God said to Moses, after the sixth day, God called him up. So he went and a cloud covered the mountain for that six days. And then he went up and he heard God. The glory of God rested on that place. So here we read the same story. Jesus this time takes his disciples leads them up by themselves that means he led them when he says he led them by themselves it wasn't like taking their hand and forcing them he became the one that guided them along the way that's what it is for you and what's for me that we are being led by the spirit to go on this highest realm or highest position in the spirit and guess what happens verse 2 and he was transfigured before them his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them. Moses had experienced this once, but this time he begins to see everything that he received on that mountain concerning the law was pointing at the Christ to come. And now he came to witness that this is the one that God spoke of to me on this mountain on Sinai. But now the fulfillment of that on Zion. Verse 4, then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us uh, make um, here three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Mount Zion is the mountain of sonship. Sons dwell on Mount Zion. This is the new covenant. Sons, free, not under the law, not under the bondage of the law, not under any elements. They are the ones that are the master of all. They are the Lord of all. They are the lords over whom Jesus Christ is the Lord. They are the kings over whom Jesus is the king. They are the priests over whom Jesus is the high priest. They are God's kings, God's priests, God's lords on earth. Okay, they receive their strength from him and they walk on earth in that strength. Let's quickly look at um, 
let me see if I have if I can find a couple of uh, verses in the Old Testament um, look at the book of Psalm chapter chapter 2 chapter 2 verse um, verse 6 I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion the word hill is mountain I have set my king on my holy mountain of Zion okay this is Jesus being on this mountain of sonship and this is where you can meet him you can ascend and you can meet Jesus Christ in that place let me just quickly go actually through some uh, scriptures let's look at chapter 43 of the book of Psalm again just want to read some verses about uh, the word uh, mountain in the old covenant because I don't know about you but for me um, all the symbologies and a language that is in the Old Testament is so precious because it carries within within it uh, things that can't be described otherwise. God uses these natural elements of the world to speak of the beauty of uh, our relationship with Him. All right. So for me, that's why it's important to understand what fatness is, what a high mountain is, what a uh, river is, or what a horse is. And without understanding those things, we turn them into, uh, once again, legalism and end times teachings and things like that. And suddenly, before you know, you're back to Sinai. You're not on Mount Zion. You're not eating and drinking with the God of heaven. You're not ascending higher so that the, on the tablets of your heart, his new law of the spirit of freedom can be written. Okay, so that's why for me, I, I, I would always go back. I, you can look at my uh, Old Testament Bible. Or Old Testament portion of my Bible that I have actually circled these things, highlighted these things, have cross references before them, beside them, because I want to know what is this story. And that's why I mean the scriptures begin to open up for you one by one. So let's look at chapter 43 and verse um, 3. It says, Oh, send your light and your truth. Now, this is just amazing. Um, John chapter 1 says, He was the light that was coming to the world, that gives light to every man. John chapter 14 says, I am the way, all right, uh, and the truth. Now, both of them are in this verse. Oh, send your light and your truth. Send Jesus, basically. Let them lead me. Let Jesus lead me. Doesn't it say that he led them up by themselves on this high mountain and then it was where the cloud appeared the voice of God was heard so it says the light and truth will lead you on this mountain Jesus follow him and you will be on this high mountain let them bring me to your holy mountain and to your tabernacle okay so the mountain of the Lord the Mount Zion is is also tabernacle it's where he dwells God dwells on this mountain, okay? God dwells in the midst of his son. Second Corinthians chapter 7 says, Come out from among them, says the Lord, and be separate. And just as it was written, uh, I shall, uh, they shall be my sons, I shall be their father, and I will dwell in their midst, okay? God, our father, would dwell in the midst of his sons. Also look at, Chapter 48 uh, of the book of Psalm, verse 1. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. No need for explanation. In his holy mountain, beautiful in elevation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north. Romans chapter 8 speaks of these sons that are the hope of this creation, Mount Zion. They are the hope of this creation. Creation is waiting for the manifestation of sons of God. They're groaning, in fact, for this. Um, 
and then he goes on to say the city of the great king okay so everything that we desire this blood of the new covenant the, the righteousness the just spirits the um, mediator of the new covenant the innumerable company of messengers that bring the gospel the uh, basically the city of god the festal gatherings of the saints together all of them in one place called mount zion new covenant mountain of sonship all right so let's look at a couple more other verses uh, same chapter verse 11 says let the mount zion rejoice and let the daughters of judah be glad because of your judgment walk about zion and go all around her count her towers and then he goes on to say basically what i wanted to, you to see verse 11 let the mount zion rejoice okay this is again a place of feasting a place of enjoying the passover the unleavened bread it's a place of rejoicing in the work that god has done and he says that's when you are eating and drinking like the elders of israel and you can be like moses amongst them that because of that strength of that eating and drinking you can go even higher and then you can have the law of the lord being written in your heart and that would cause you to be the one from whom the law of the lord shall go forth the word of the Lord shall go forth. Okay, and everyone thirsts for, for the word of the Lord. You shall be the one that from whom this uh, shall go forth. <clears throat> okay, so let's see what else we can find. Um, chapter 74. Psalm chapter 74. Uh, Verse 2, remember your congregation which you have purchased of old, the tribe of your inheritance which you have redeemed. This Mount Zion where you have dwelt. Okay, God dwells on Mount Zion. This is the tribe of Judah. He's basically the tribe of inheritance. These are the ones that actually come to Jerusalem. They are the kings on this city all right so these are all by the way i'm reading these things not because i mean it's they're great scriptures to read these speak of you okay these speak of you have you you as the one who has come to this mountain to mount zion to this new covenant and because of that you know you're not anymore under the law you're under uh this blood that constantly keeps you in that place purges your conscience so you don't descend you remain ascended even 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 speaks of a voice like a shout of a trumpet that causes you to be caught up with the Lord in the air and thus you shall be with him forever. To be in the same air that the Lord himself dwells in. To be breathing the same air that the only thing that in it uh, is in existence is the Lord himself. So he becomes literally the air that you breathe in see these things have nothing to do with that old way of understanding uh these scriptures these are symbolic and i hope that you're uh blessed by hearing these things okay so um let me see if there's something else that i can quickly uh find out i wanted to read something for you from uh so uh okay yeah uh, sorry isaiah isaiah chapter 33 verse 5 the lord is exalted for he dwells on high he has filled zion with justice and righteousness he has filled zion with justice and with righteousness look at verse 20 look upon zion the city of the appointed feasts i mean that's just amazing these things, I mean, this book can be written possibly without the inspiration of God. To, to see things that are mentioned here and you come to the New Testament and you find the reality of them. Zion is the city of the appointed feast. Just like Hebrews 12 says, you have come to this Zion, the festal gathering, the place of feasts. Okay. 
Your eyes will see Jerusalem, a quiet home, a tabernacle that will not be taken down. Not one of its stakes will ever be removed, nor will any of its cords be broken. But let me just continue. It's beautiful. But there the majestic Lord, the majestic Lord will be for us a place of broad rivers and streams in which no uh, galley with oars will sail, nor majestic ship, ships pass by. For the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. Okay, this is where you are not anymore under guardians. You are not under the tutors. You are not under the stewards. You are free from them. You are under because the time appointed by the Father has come. He sent His Son. You are free now. You are being taught by the Lord Himself. Jesus said, in fact, in John chapter uh, six, when He said that if you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you shall have life. And they said, who can accept these things? He said, well, it was written that. Everyone shall be taught by God. So basically he was saying, this is it. God is teaching you by my flesh and my blood that is being given to you so you can eat and you can drink and you can come closer to God. This is the teaching of God that through son, through the son, the first four son, you can experience sonship. And God will teach you through his son. On the Mount of Transfiguration, the voice was, Hear my son, not the law and the prophets. He is the one who echoes the voice of the Father. He is the one through whom the voice of God is even heard, as it's supposed to be heard. All right. And uh, all right, so I think that's about it. Let me see if there was anything else. Um, So perhaps we can look at, okay, yeah, uh, Psalm 84, and I will end by this. It says, how lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts, the tabernacle of the Lord. Check Revelation chapter 21. Then Jerusalem comes on Mount Zion. It is said, now the tabernacle of God is with man. So what is the tabernacle, tabernacle of God is Jerusalem. What is that? It's you, the bride of Christ. And how lovely is this tabernacle of the Lord. My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself. Where she, where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They will still be praising you, Selah. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you. Wow. Whose heart is set on pilgrimage. Pilgrimage is, uh, I know this because of, I mean, my background in Islam. Uh, there was a pilgrimage for Muslims once a year that they would go to wherever they were. They would go to uh, basically uh, Saudi Arabia to this city Mecca, and that's where they thought it's the house of God. And they would begin to go around a stone, and they would uh, kind of celebrate all of that. That was called the p pilgrimage. And he says, "Now, blessed is the man whose." Uh, strength is in you whose heart is set on pilgrimage so where are they going if they're going on this man is going to a pilgrimage verse 6 as they pass through the valley of Baca they make it a spring the rain also covers it with uh, pools they go from strength to strength do you see ascension from strength to strength from elevation to elevation each one appears before God in Zion. That's just amazing. So they appear, they, they ascend because they will appear before him. God is calling us to Mount Zion. He's calling us just, he called the elders of Israel and Moses. 
and he's even calling us higher just as he called Moses and the proof of that is Revelation chapter 4 it says I saw a door open in heaven and the first words that I heard was like a trumpet saying come up here and I will show you things which must shortly take place after this and suddenly I saw a throne and one sat on the throne whose glory was like a rainbow and all of that and he said this was where God dwells this is the throne of God this is that kingdom that we are talking about we say kingdom 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 where is that kingdom what is that kingdom well the book of revelation gives us a beautiful expression and definitions and through the symbolic language of what that is so we are called to go from strength to strength how he says the man whose strength is in you so the lord himself becomes the one upon whom we walk he becomes the steps upon whom we walk upward he becomes the ladder upon whom we go forward if you walk or mount up on jesus that would be him leading you by yourself into the very presence of the god of heaven isn't that beautiful he said that uh uh, basically, he was the fulfillment or he is the fulfillment of Jacob's ladder. A ladder whose feet was on earth, whose top was in heaven. And he said, you know, to Nathaniel, he said, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the son of man. So he was that ladder. He is that ladder for us to go on this mountain. He himself is on the top of the mountain as the God of heaven, but he also is the ladder to get us there. Didn't he say, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father except through me? I mean, it's just beautiful. I can't go on anymore. Please enjoy it and just go through your discussion. I believe that this would be an amazing day for uh, all of you who are uh, going through these small groups, and you will have great discussions. Bless you guys. I'll see you in the next week. Welcome back, family, and thank you, Masood, for bringing us this teaching what a powerful time in the Word of God, looking at the mountain of Zion. Such a blessing. And so we're going to bring this together in five important points um, that we think are important for us to take with us as we move through the week. So here we go. The first one is this, and this is a foundational point that I think it's important to understand. And this applies to all the teachings we've done, no matter what it is. The first point is this, is that the Bible is the account of two realities. And so think about it this way. If we were to, to zoom out, um, there's so much detail. There's so many stories. There's so many accounts. Um, there's so much content uh, that is so rich and so tightly interwound between the Old Testament, the New Testament, what is happening in Revelation, all of it. If, if we were to zoom out and look at the overarching message in the Bible, first and foremost, it, it's the Father's plan for mankind. And that's what it is. Um, secondly, I think it's important to know that the way the scripture reveals that master plan is by showing us the count of two realities. And we see this principle everywhere in scripture. It talks about the old versus the new, dark versus light, flesh versus spirit, um, what is seen and physical versus what is unseen and spiritual, what is external versus what is internal. The law versus grace, works versus faith, toiling versus peace, death versus life, old covenant versus new covenant. And so there's this duality that we see in scripture, um, and it really highlights the account of what it is to live in sonship versus what it is to live outside of sonship. And also what we come to see in this week's teaching is a contrast between the two mountains. And that's the, the premise for this week's teaching. The second point is this, is that Mount Zion is the mountain of the new covenant. And so uh, this is important for us to understand because we see Mount Zion everywhere in scripture. And it's important that we understand it as this revelation of the new mountain and the new covenant. Uh, as Mount Sinai was in the mountain of old covenant, which the scripture says gives birth to bondage, that's what it says in Galatians 4.24. We see that a mountain is something where birth is given or where something is born. 
If we look in contrast to Mount Sinai, Mount Zion is the new covenant. And as Mount Sinai gives birth to bondage, Zion, in contrast, gives birth to the heirs of God, which is you and I. The scripture says that Jesus was the firstborn of this new covenant. And if he was the firstborn, of course, that means that there are others also born on this mountain of Zion. And that's exciting. That would be you and I, our believers, which are born of faith. The third point is this, is that when you put yourself under time, you're subjecting yourself to the elements of the old world. Uh, this principle is so key. And we touched on this last week, but, but it sort of went under the radar. Uh, and Masood revisits it this week, so I'm not going to pass it by. Uh, I'm going to mention it here on, on our recap points. Um, I want you to consider this. When, whenever we have the feeling of despair or regret or of hopelessness, it is centered around the concept and the principle of time. If you pause a minute, think about those situations. We have those feelings because we believe that something has gone wrong and too much time has gone by to make it right or there isn't enough time to make it right. It's irreversible because of the element of time. And so let's look at this closely because the scripture addresses this head on. Colossians 2.16, um, we read this last week. It says, so let no one judge you in food or drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or the Sabbath. And here's what I want to point out to you is that these things that it's talking that we don't be judged by, a festival, a new moon, and the Sabbath, these are all markers of one thing. They are markers of time. And Paul is saying, don't be judged by this element of time. And the thing we have to be aware of is that religion or the law, or even in today's religion, also introduces this element of time when it positions the promise of God always in the future, in the sweet by and by, or of a heaven that is yet to come, that's where our hope is. That's what religion teaches us. But look what it says in Galatians 4.4. 4. It says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. It's so powerful that he calls out this fullness of time had come. And so this element or this constraint of time had been fulfilled. Jesus come and faith is now. And this is what we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. It says, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And so this was core to our message a couple of weeks ago, this principle of time uh, and, and living outside of this dimension of time as we walk in our promises, when we looked at the difference between living on the promises of God versus living in our inheritance. The promise is always connected to something in the future. I promise you something. So I'm promising of something that is to come. Versus when we are heirs, we are living in our inheritance. The thing that was promised to me is now real and available to me. We aren't waiting for something in the future. We aren't star staring at the skies waiting for God to do something. There isn't a blessing or a salvation that is yet to come. Today, here, now is the day of salvation, and now we are the man, and now we are one with Christ. This mystery is revealed um, is not, not about, uh, it's not about a heaven on a different planet, sometime in the future. This mystery revealed in scripture is the reality of our life with the Father, and it's only under this new covenant where we can experience that. It's only when we don't subject ourselves to the elements of the old that we can experience this new life and this new man. Okay, I said a lot there. Let's move on. Uh, point four is this, is that Mount Zion is a place where we ascend into sonship. Amen. And so everything that we desire and everything that we are aiming for um, is found at this place that the scripture refers to Mount Zion. And so this is a place of our full maturity and sonship. This is a place of the new covenant of righteousness and the just spirit. 
what we read were the innumerable company of messengers of the gospel where we eat and drink and celebrate and rejoice at the festive gathering of the saints, the place where our hearts are the very tablets that the Lord writes and memorializes his law of love. Mount Zion is the place where we are in the presence of our Father and in full fellowship and joy with him, unaffected by the things that are below the skyline of the mountain. This is the place where the fullness of our sonship in our inheritance is found. And so all of this is found at the place in the spirit that the scripture refers to Mount Zion. And my fifth and final point is this, is that the journey of our maturity is our ascension up on Mount Zion. And so we read in Revelation where John was taken in the spirit to a high mountain and God calls him to come higher. We see this in other places in the type and shadow of Moses where we read, on Mount Sinai, he goes to a level with the elders and then God calls him higher, to a higher level of pure presence with him. We read in Psalms 84, 7 that we go from strength to strength. We see a principle of progression. And in 2 Corinthians 3, 18, it says that we are being transformed into this image. From what? From glory to glory by the Spirit of the Lord. And so we see this progression of growing in strength, moving from glory to glory. And, and, and let's keep in context because this is so powerful as it relates to our message, what the word glory means. If you, if you dissect that, glory means to bring visibility to something, right? When we glorify something is we are elevating it. We are making it larger. We are bringing the true essence of what it is to greater visibility, and it says that we move from glory to glory or from visibility to visibility in the presence of God. And so the higher up the mountain you go, the, the fire, higher up the mountain you go, the more visibility you have. And we were having a conversation in this past home group this past week uh, with some dear friends, Ron and Andrea Dishler, and we were talking about skiing. And, and we were having this conversation about how awesome it is to ski out west because the scenery and the way nature is and the way the mountains are, are just amazing. And one of the things that we talked about, which is true, is you come to some of these mountains and you can spend 30, 45 minutes going up a lift on a mountain and you get to that and you get up there, the temperature is different, the atmosphere is different, you get off the lift and you're like, wow, this is, this is amazing. But then you look and there's another lift and that lift takes you even higher up the mountain and you go to a completely different atmosphere, many times above the clouds where you are and you are then at the top of the mountain to enjoy the journey and the descension, which we also touched on um, in, this, in, this, in this teaching. So that's what it is um, on the mountain of Zion. That's what's powerful, that's what's glorious, is that this isn't, there's no stagnation here, is that we are constantly growing constantly maturing. And that's the climb up Mount Zion that we are called, that you and I are called to, to this place of full sonship with the Father. Well, family, we hope that you've been blessed by this. I know that we covered a lot of material. Thank you for staying with us. Um, there's a lot here for you to digest, for you to talk about amongst yourself and in your groups. Be blessed this week. We are praying for you and we are believing that the Lord in Jesus Christ is taking up at this mountain higher and higher into the presence with him. We love you. We'll see you next week.